China has launched the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And despite the reluctance of the United States, countries around the world are signing on, although not Canada, at least not yet. Joining us now for more on what the new bank aims to do and whether Canada should join, in Syracuse, New York, Hong Ying Wang. She's a political scientist at the University of Waterloo and senior fellow at CG, the Center for International Governance Innovation. And it's good to have you on TVO tonight. Perhaps we can start, Hong Ying Wang, by your having tell us, what's this new bank supposed to do? Um, as you can tell from the name of the bank, uh, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, it is designed to mobilize resources um, to develop infrastructure mostly in the region in the near term and uh, hopefully, as they say, uh, outside the region as well in the, in the future. And why does China think there's a need to create its own bank for this? Um, I think, first of all, we need to uh, recognize that there is a tremendous need for infrastructure in Asia. Uh, there are lots of countries whose development uh, would be or could be helped uh, with better infrastructure. Um, a few years ago, the Asian Development Bank uh, came up with a study that uh, said that the region had a tremendous need that would take uh, $8 trillion uh, between 2010 and 2020. So there is a big gap. A more recent study, actually, by HSBC uh, put that number uh, at $11 trillion between now and 10 or 15 years from now. So whichever study you look at, uh, it's unquestionable there is a tremendous need. So that's the first point. The second point, why does China uh, feel that it has a role to play? Um, well, that has uh, several dimensions. First of all, China has accumulated uh, a lot of foreign reserves, and China's savings have been tremendous over recent years. So there is uh, certainly a lot of uh, financial capability on the part of China. Um, and secondly, China in recent years has developed uh, a great deal of um, manufacturing capacity in terms of equipment uh, necessary for infrastructure and technological capability and, and also personnel management and so on. So they feel that with their capability and to some extent over capacity, uh, this is actually a good opportunity for China to export some of that. Okay, but uh, some people may conclude uh, we already have institutions to do this kind of thing. The World Bank exists. The International Monetary Fund exists. Aren't they supposed to be dealing with these? And if that's the case, then why do we need another one? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, well, we, we have to uh, look at, the, the first of all, the gap between what I just uh, mentioned about the uh, needs of infrastructure needs on the one hand, and the capability of traditional uh, development institutions like the World Bank and the Asia Development Bank. Um, the gap is huge. Uh, those banks probably invest tens of billions of dollars a year in various projects, uh, whereas the needs are a lot more than that. Um, and secondly, uh, actually in recent years, the traditional development banks uh, have focused more on other issues, uh, having to do, let's say, with poverty reduction, better governance, um, and so on. So uh, they actually have not put a lot of their resources in infrastructure per se. So. Um, from China's point of view, this is a, a gap that needs to be filled that traditional institutions are not able or certainly uh, have not shown a great deal of willingness to fill. Understood. Okay, where does the budget for this new bank come from? Well, China has uh, promised $50 billion uh, in, uh, at the beginning uh, of its own uh, contribution. And now with uh, a growing number of member countries, uh, their subscription would also go into uh, the uh, initial capital. And then the bank, like any other development bank, will be raising capital uh, from the international capital market. Uh, so I think that's basically how uh, they hope to proceed in terms of budget. And how big a bank do they expect to have, let's say, a year from now? How much money do you think would be in there? Oh, that, that's difficult to say uh, because a lot of it, I mean, we, we know uh, the Chinese uh, government has said the more members are joining, then the more um, the, the kind of contribution will be uh, shared and distributed among larger numbers of countries. Um, 
so that's one source that could change uh, of how much money there is. And the other is how much capital China, a Chinese, a China-led bank can raise. So that has to do with the credit uh, rating of the new bank, uh, of which we really don't know very much uh, yet, in part because we don't know the governance structure, how much credibility it will have uh, in the international capital market. So I'm not able to answer that question specifically. No. Okay, understood. If, you're, if a project is to be eligible, though, to tap the resources of this new bank, does it actually have to be built in the Asia-Pacific? I think the, if you look at the statement uh, of the, it's kind of a mission statement, uh, the Chinese uh, certainly have given the impression that's where projects are going to start. Uh, but they did say in the future, uh, the projects could go beyond the region. But for the near future, I would say, yes, they, they have to uh, take place in the Asia Pacific region. Okay. One of the interesting things about this bank, I mean, it's called the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and yet, Mm -hmm. I see many non-Asian countries that are joining it. The United Kingdom has joined, France has joined, Germany has joined, Netherlands has joined. Australia, which is, I guess, increasingly seeing itself now as an Asian country, has joined as well. How come so many other countries mm -hmm. are trying to get into this? Uh, well, uh, I mean, first of all, uh, I think the Chinese who started the bank uh, said at the very beginning that this is a new development bank that's open to everybody. So uh, it was meant to invest mostly in Asia, at least uh, for the first period of time. But uh, the con contribution was never meant to be only limited to Asia. So I think uh, many other countries outside the region see this as a, an economic opportunity and uh, they feel that either they and their companies could benefit uh, from projects uh, led, uh, organized by the bank, or they feel that by being uh, part of this China-led initiative, they're going to uh, gain the goodwill of China, uh, or at least be at the table uh, to influence its governance and its operation in the future. So I, I think there are a variety of reasons. In the case of the UK, uh, I think we all know that UK uh, very much uh, hopes to preserve the status of London as an international financial center. And with the internationalization of the Chinese currency, um, to get a lot of RMB business is almost uh, crucial for any city to stay central to the uh, international financial market and system. So from that point of view, it makes sense for the UK to, to join, despite US opposition. Uh, for these other countries, the interests could be very diverse, very broad. Um, Germany, Italy, Australia, uh, some are big trading partners of China. Uh, some depend uh, on China for their uh, resources in particular. Uh, so for various reasons, uh, there seems to have been a domino effect after the UK uh, joined. But well, it does make a lot of economic sense. I was yeah. going to say, using your metaphor, the, uh, the dominoes stop. Um, across the Atlantic Ocean. Notable by its absence on that list of countries I gave is the United States of America, and I want to read this from The Economist and then get you to react to it. America, however, has reacted negatively to the AIIB. Its officials argue that they have not lobbied against it. Instead, they merely stressed how important it is that such an institution abide by international standards of transparency, creditworthiness, environmental sustainability, and so on. Uh, okay, that's the official story. Why do you think the United States has yet to sign on and so far has been pretty lukewarm about the whole thing? Uh, I think from the U.S. point of view, anything China leads uh, could seem to be worrisome and suspicious uh, because uh, I think we understand uh, recent years have seen China's influence, at least uh, in the economic realm, uh, going up pretty rapidly. And at the same time, there's been a lot of talk and worry about U.S. decline. So when you look at China's uh, economic policy or initiatives through that lens, uh, it could be seen as part of this continuous um, rise of China at the expense of the United States. So it's very understandable for the U.S. as the current um, hegemonic power or leading power in the world to, to feel to feel concerned and worried. Um, and 
and, and I think in this case, though, uh, the U.S. Uh, has been overreacting. Um, I mean, in a way, it's contradicting its earlier call for China to take up more responsibility uh, in global governance, uh, to make more contribution. And I mean, China is in some ways doing exactly that. It's, it's mobilizing resources to fill a need that we talked about earlier. So I think while the U.S. Uh, negative uh, response is understandable, given its worry about overall competition with China. Uh, in this case, it has been quite uh, unnecessary. Do you think the Americans are being accurate when they say they have not lobbied against this bank? That they have not lobbied against it? Yes. Uh, I think we know very well. I mean, news media have reported uh, numerous uh, efforts uh, on the part of the U.S. to discourage uh, other countries from joining uh, for the reasons that you uh, cited before. So um, I'm not sure what is meant by the U.S. has not lobbied against it. Uh, but I, I do say, uh, I do think that the U.S. has changed its position uh, somewhat, mellowed quite a bit um, after the deadline of new membership, uh, founding membership application. Uh, Jacob Liu, U.S. Uh, official, as a special envoy for President Obama, uh, went to China, had a talk with China's uh, Premier Li Keqiang, and very clearly said that, uh, in, in a more mellow tone, that uh, the U.S. was okay with the new bank uh, and was actually ready and interested in ex uh, exploring opportunities to collaborate with the new bank. So um, I, I think that is a positive sign uh, that this probably uh, will not be as much of a lightning rod of the two countries competing. Uh, rather, it could be new opportunities to cooperate in the future. Well, having said that, Canada announced just the other day that it was not going to join. And I mean, there's tons of speculation as to what's behind that, but certainly one of the inferences many people are drawing is the U.S. The US put pressure on Canada not to join, and therefore Canada didn't. Do you think that makes sense? I mean, do you th first of all, do you think that's a reasonable inference to draw from Canada's declining to participate? Um, I, I think that's probably a reasonable inference. Uh, but, you know, I, I wouldn't know from the outside what was the reason. But I don't really think uh, Canada's uh, failure to join as a founding member necessarily is going to be a permanent uh, loss uh, for either side. I think um, I think uh, Canada is is taking the position of let's wait and see, and uh, it does not indicate in the future or even in the near future uh, that China, uh, that it's not possible for for Canada to join this China-led uh, bank. So. Um, it's, it's difficult to know the reason, but I think moving forward, uh, this is not a defining kind of a moment to say this is it. Uh, Canada is out, and that's uh, the end of the story. Uh, I'm sure China will be open-minded, as they say. Uh, you know, if you're not uh, a founding member, it doesn't mean you are out. Uh, the, the institution remains open. What it does mean, however, is Canada will not be at the table when the rules are being made. But again, you know, there are plenty of Western countries who share Canada's values and concerns. So I, I don't think that even is a, is a permanent damage. Do you think we should join sooner than later? Yeah, I do, I do think um, Canada has very little to lose in joining and potentially quite a lot to gain. So as, as we know, Canada depends a lot on exporting resources. And infrastructure is extremely important. Um, to be able to export Canada's resources to Asia in a more efficient way definitely benefits uh, Canada. And, uh, and also, just overall, to be part of this um, kind of growing uh, Asian economy in, in one more way is, is going to ultimately, I think, open up opportunities, depending on how you know, Canadian companies and the, Canada, the Canadian government managed uh, the opportunities as well as the challenge. So I think on balance, I, I would say it, it's definitely in the interest of Canada to join. All right. In uh, our sooner last, than later. Forgive me. In our last couple of minutes here, let me just read one more thing. This from the blogs of the Financial Times and get you to comment on yeah. this. Alan Beatty writes, while the participation of European governments is testament to China's economic power, it comes at a cost to China's control of the institution. Reports that China will give up veto power in return for European involvement suggest Beijing recognizes 
it needs political legitimacy and is prepared to make concessions to get it. By doing so, Beijing has, in effect, now invited Western countries with their active and vocal NGO communities to do to the AIIB what they have done to the World Bank, continuously badger it to impose restrictions on its lending because of environmental and human rights concerns and loudly publicize breaches thereof. Is all of that correct in your view? Well, I think uh, China has certainly been a fast learner in the last few months. I think when China signed the MOU about this bank uh, with 20 other Asian countries in October of last year, um, Chinese officials probably weren't thinking about these very issues, uh, at least not very high on their agenda. Uh, but now, uh, with the uh, participation of uh, traditional, um, you know, members of uh, international financial institutions being part of this new institution, these issues have risen quite high on the agenda uh, of the Chinese policymakers. And they, in recent days, weeks, have talked about uh, adopting the best uh, practice of existing institutions, um, you know, living up to the highest standard of transparency, of uh, high environmental uh, standards, and uh, also recruit widely uh, from everywhere in the world uh, to staff the new institution. And so th that all go in the same direction as, as what you were just saying, is incorporating uh, participation from NGOs and, and other watchdogs and, and, and be uh, transparent and high standards. So I think, uh, in a way, this may have been happening faster than, uh, than what China originally uh, expected. But I think it's overall a, a very good, a good sign for all sides. Honying Wang from the University of Waterloo. It's been good to have you on TVO tonight. Thanks so much for your participation. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.